Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. This is part one of a three-part series on starlight, where we'll learn what the light from stars can tell us. In this video, we'll explore why stars have different brightnesses and how this relates to their distance from us. We'll also discuss how we can use the spectrum of a star's light to investigate its composition and motion. In part two, we'll learn how to classify stars using the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And in part three, we'll learn why some stars, called variable stars, change brightness. Astronomy literally means studying stars, from the Greek meaning the law of the stars. Modern astronomy is much more, and includes planets, comets, gravity, dark matter and energy, even aliens. But today we're actually going to study the stars. First, we'll have to get a handle on distances. Stars are incomprehensibly far away, and trying to use everyday measurements like metres or kilometres just isn't going to cut it. So astronomers use their own special units. Our Sun is 150 million kilometres away. So this becomes the basis for our interplanetary unit. The distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. But even our closest neighbour, Proxima Centauri, shown here, is a ridiculous 269,000 astronomical units away. Clearly, for more distant stars, even the astronomical unit is going to be impractically small. So let's think bigger. Light is the fastest thing in the universe. Nothing can go faster, and the speed of light is often called the universe's speed limit. This speed is about 300 million metres per second, or 3 times 10 to the power 8 metres per second. Even at this speed, it takes light 8.3 minutes to reach us from the Sun. So we can say that the Sun is 8.3 light minutes away. The Sun is 150 million kilometres away. Proxima Centauri is 40 trillion kilometres away. And light takes 4.2 years to travel that distance. So Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years away. So our interstellar distance unit is the light year, or LY, the distance light travels in one year. Take care, lots of people see the word year and mistakenly think the light year is a unit of time. Remember, it's a unit of distance. But astronomers don't generally use the light year. Instead, they use a slightly larger unit called the parsec. This one takes a little more explaining. Hold your thumb up at arm's length. Doesn't matter which thumb. Close your left eye and look at your thumb with your right eye. Notice the objects behind and around your thumb. Now, close your right eye and open your left eye. Your thumb has shifted to the right. It's in a different position relative to the background objects. Of course, your thumb hasn't really moved, but the position of your observation has, since your eyes are about six centimetres apart. This effect is called parallax. In the same way, we can get a different view of the stars if we observe from different locations. The stars are much further away than your thumb, so we'll need our two locations to be very far apart to see any parallax. Luckily, we can move two astronomical units just by waiting six months for the Earth to orbit the Sun halfway. You can see a stronger parallax effect in this pair of images. One was taken from Earth, and the other by the New Horizons space probe on the same day, and you can clearly see the parallax of Proxima Centauri. This effect is only noticeable for nearby stars. Most of the stars in these images shift by too small an amount to be detectable. We call these much more distant stars background stars. Don't worry, we're nearly there. Stellar parallax is tiny, much less than one degree. That's okay, because we can split degrees into small units. One degree is split into 60 arc minutes. Just like one minute is one sixtieth of an hour, one arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree. And then we split arc minutes into 60 arc seconds, just like we split one minute into 60 seconds. You should already know the symbol for a degree. Arc minutes and arc seconds have their own special symbols, shown here, but they're very similar to single and double quote marks, so many astronomers just use those. One arc second is a tiny one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. But even this is bigger than the biggest stellar parallax for the closest star, Proxima Centauri, just 0 0.7 arc seconds. Until stellar parallax was first observed in 1838, many astronomers doubted it even existed. And now we're finally ready to define the parsec. First, measure the parallax of a star from two locations 1 AU apart. To do this, measure the parallax from either side of the Earth's orbit and halve it. If the parallax is one arc second, 
the star has a distance of one parsec. You can see this in this very not to scale diagram. Parsec comes from parallax of one arc second and is shortened to lowercase pc. The parsec is still a small distance in the universe at 3.26 light years. Even Proxima Centauri is further than this, about 1.3 parsecs away. We typically use parsecs for the distances between stars, killer parsecs for large structures like our galaxy, and mega parsecs to measure the distance between galaxies. Andromeda, the nearest major galaxy, is 0.89 mega parsecs away. What's the brightest star in the sky? Most people would say the Sun. Some might say Sirius, but it's a bit more complicated than that. The brightest known star is R136A1, six million times brighter than the Sun, but it's not even visible to the naked eye. You know that a bright light at night, such as a car's headlight, seems dimmer the further away it is. This is because light spreads out. It radiates from its source in an ever-expanding sphere. This diagram shows a portion of three spheres and a light source S. If you are at S looking out, each portion at radius R, 2R and 3R would appear the same size in your vision. We say they subtend the same angle. There are 14 total squares shown here, all the same size, and nine light rays are shown coming from S. If we look at the top left squares labelled A, at distance R, all nine rays hit A. At distance 2R, three rays hit A, and at 3R, just one ray hits A. So the further you are from the source, the less light hits a certain area, and the dimmer the source appears. At each section of a sphere, the same amount of light is spread over an ever-increasing area. At R, the light covers one square. At 2R, four squares. And at 3R, nine squares. The number of squares is proportional to the distance squared. One squared equals one, 2 squared equals 4, and 3 squared equals 9. So while each section of the spheres gets the same light, each A-sized square within that section gets only a share of that light, equal to the total light divided by the distance squared. The apparent brightness of the source is proportional to 1 divided by the distance squared. This is called the inverse square law. This comes up a lot in astronomy. You may remember it from Newton's law of gravitation from my video of the heliocentric model. The stars in the sky vary in apparent brightness, and an unknown astronomer in ancient Greece decided to classify the stars, sorting them into six groups of brightness called magnitude. The brightest stars are first magnitude, or magnitude one, the next brightest group are second magnitude, or magnitude two, and so on all the way to magnitude six, the faintest stars visible to the naked eye. This was a bit vague for English astronomer Norman Pogson, who, in 1856, made this more mathematical, saying that magnitude 1 stars are exactly 100 times brighter than magnitude 6 stars. In fact, any difference of 5 magnitudes is a difference of 100 times brightness. Magnitude 2 stars are 100 times brighter than magnitude 7 stars, magnitude 3 is 100 times brighter than magnitude 8, and so on. This is a logarithmic scale, and allows us to have fractional magnitudes, like 2.6. If you don't understand logarithms, that's okay, just learn how they work here. The maths tells us that a magnitude difference of 1 corresponds to a brightness multiplier of 2.5. Learn these key facts. Lower magnitudes are brighter, a magnitude 5 lower is 100 times brighter, and a magnitude 1 lower is 2.5 times brighter. Pogson's system let us use magnitudes above 6, below 1, and decimals. For example, Proxima Centauri is magnitude 11, invisible to the naked eye. Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, is magnitude minus 1.46. And the Sun is magnitude minus 27. But this does mean we're stuck using smaller magnitudes for brighter stars. Let's try some practice questions. An asterism has three stars. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. Question 1. Alpha has magnitude 2.6. Beta has magnitude 4.6. How many times brighter is Alpha than Beta? Question 2. Gamma is 100 times fainter than Alpha. What is the magnitude of Gamma? Pause the video now to try these.
In question 1, the difference in magnitudes is 2.0. A difference of one magnitude means a multiplier of 2.5. So a difference of 2.0 means we raise 2.5 to the power of 2.0. Alpha is 6.25 times brighter than beta. In question 2, we have a difference factor, or multiplier, of 100, which corresponds to a magnitude difference of 5. Since gamma is fainter, we add this number. 2.6 plus 5 equals 7.6. So far, we've been talking about the magnitude of stars as seen from Earth. We call this apparent magnitude, how bright a star appears to be. But since this depends on the star's distance, it doesn't tell us that much about the star. In astrophysics, we're much more interested in how bright the star actually is. We could measure this in a number of ways, and astronomers have settled on something we call absolute magnitude. This is the apparent magnitude that a star would have if it were exactly 10 parsecs away. By putting every star at the same distance, it's much easier to compare them. For example, if Rigel were 10 parsecs away, its apparent magnitude would be minus 7, brighter than any planet. So Rigel's absolute magnitude is minus 7. The Sun's absolute magnitude is 4.83. If the Sun were 10 parsecs away, it would be barely visible, and we might not even have a name for it. The picture on the left shows the night sky as it actually looks, using apparent magnitude. On the right are the stars visible from Earth if they were all brought to a distance of 10 parsecs, showing their absolute magnitude. We have an equation called the distance modulus formula, that links apparent magnitude, absolute magnitude, and distance. Big M equals little m plus 5 minus 5 times log d, where big M is absolute magnitude, little m is apparent magnitude, and d is distance, measured in parsecs. Log is short for logarithm. If you understand this, great, but for GCSE astronomy, it's just a button on your calculator. This equation is given at the front of the GCSE exam paper, you should be able to use it to find absolute or apparent magnitude, but you don't need to find distance for the GCSE. Let's try a couple of practice questions. Proxima Centauri has an apparent magnitude of 11 and is 1.3 parsecs away. What is its absolute magnitude? And Betelgeuse has an absolute magnitude of minus 5.85 and is 168 parsecs away. What is its apparent magnitude? Pause the video now and give these a go. First, write down the equation. Then, put the numbers in. For Proxima Centauri, absolute magnitude equals 11, plus 5, minus 5 times log of 1.3. Put this into your calculator, and the result is 15.4. Do the same for Betelgeuse. Negative 5.85 equals apparent magnitude plus 5 minus 5 times log of 168. Simplify that by calculating 5 minus 5 times log of 168 and we get negative 5.85 equals apparent magnitude plus negative 6.13. Rearrange that and apparent magnitude is negative 5.85 minus negative 6.13 which comes to 0 0.28. Be careful with the negatives in these questions. Now we're going to take a closer look at starlight, starting with why stars shine. A star forms when a huge cloud of gas and dust comes together by gravitational attraction. The cloud begins with lots of gravitational potential energy. As it collapses, the gravitational potential energy turns into kinetic energy. The close, fast-moving particles collide frequently, turning kinetic energy into thermal energy. A very hot protostar forms. And soon, nuclear fusion begins in the core, generating even more thermal energy. We'll look at star formation in more depth in a future video. For now, it's enough to know that stars reach a very high temperature, generally between about 3000 and 50,000 Kelvin. All hot objects release electromagnetic radiation, and here, hot means any temperature above absolute zero, zero Kelvin or minus 273 degrees Celsius. Fire glows orange-yellow because soot particles, carbon in the air, reaches over 1000 Kelvin. And even you, at about 310 Kelvin, glow, 
though this is mostly infrared radiation, not visible to the human eye. We call this glow black body radiation. Black bodies absorb all electromagnetic radiation that lands on them, gaining energy and heating up. They then emit that energy as radiation of very specific wavelengths, wavelengths that depend only on the body's temperature. This graph shows the amount of radiation of each wavelength produced as we increase the temperature of an object. At first we can barely see anything. At about 3000 Kelvin we start to see a bit, mostly infrared. By 4000 Kelvin we can see the object with human eyes, glowing red. At 5000 Kelvin we get a broad spectrum of visible light, and the object is white hot. Note that as temperature increases, the amount of radiation increases at every wavelength, but the peak wavelength shifts to lower wavelengths or higher frequencies. And past about 7500 Kelvin, our peak is in the ultraviolet. With this much ultraviolet, you wouldn't want to live around this star. It was hard to see what was going on with those colder temperatures. Let's have another look with the peak scaled to always be at the same height. This relationship means that we can tell the temperature of a star just by finding the peak wavelength of its light. You may have heard that the sun is green. It has a black body temperature of 5777 Kelvin, and this does indeed produce a peak wavelength of roughly green light, emitting more green light than any other colour. But there's plenty of light in the rest of the visible spectrum too. We evolved to make the best use of the light available, and our brains interpret sunlight as white. It is likely that an alien species would see their own star as white, even if it looks different to us. This graph shows the emissions of our sun, as well as Procyon, which at around 6,500 Kelvin looks bluish white, Menkent, around 5,000 Kelvin and glowing yellow, and the cool orange Pollux at 4,500 Kelvin. These colours are quite subjective, and most stars in the nighttime sky aren't bright enough for us to detect their colour. Almost all of them appear white. To really see the colour of stars, you'll need a spectrometer. Now you may have noticed that some things aren't black. No matter absorbs all radiation, except black holes. So there's no such thing as a perfect black body. But stars come pretty close. Here is the sun's actual spectrum, compared with the blue line showing the spectrum of a perfect black body at 5777 Kelvin. The shape is slightly off, but more importantly, there are gaps in the sun's spectrum. Some wavelengths of light are generated near the sun's surface, but don't make it out into space. This is because they're being absorbed by chemicals in the sun. Stars release black body radiation at all wavelengths of the spectrum. If we use a spectrometer to split the light from a star, we should see a smooth spectrum of all colours, but we don't. All elements and chemicals can absorb certain specific wavelengths of light. The electrons absorb the energy of a specific wavelength, become excited, and then emit that energy back out in a random direction. And some of that emitted light goes back into the star instead of towards us. So there are dark lines in the spectrum. These are called absorption lines, spectral lines, or Fraunhofer lines. This absorption works just as well in the laboratory, and we have catalogues of which wavelengths are absorbed by different elements and molecules. So we can compare a stellar spectrum with our local experiments and match the absorption lines to find out what chemicals are in a star. Here you can see the lines highlighted in white that show us that the sun has oxygen, hydrogen, sodium, iron, magnesium, and calcium at its surface. A real stellar spectrum is a bit messier than this, and absorption lines are just dark, rather than completely black. The darker a line is, the more of that particular chemical is present. So we've learned how starlight can tell us the distance to a star and its temperature and composition. Lastly today, we'll look at how starlight can tell us the speed of a star. Go to a main road near a hospital and wait for an ambulance to pass with its sirens blazing. Just as the ambulance passes you, the sound will get lower in pitch. Note the driver didn't press a button to change the sound just to mess with you. Sound waves have a certain wavelength and frequency. A higher frequency, or smaller wavelength, produces a higher pitch. 
Here you can see an animation of sound waves from a stationary ambulance. Anybody standing nearby will hear the ambulance's natural pitch. Here the ambulance is moving to the right. If you're standing on the left behind the ambulance, as it moves away the waves stretch out. The wavelength gets longer and the pitch of the siren gets lower. If you're standing in front of the ambulance, the waves bunch up as it moves towards you. The wavelength gets smaller and the siren sounds higher. The driver, moving along with the ambulance, will always hear the same natural pitch. Exactly the same thing happens with light waves. If a star is moving away from you, the waves stretch out, so the wavelength becomes longer. The light moves towards the red end of the spectrum, and we say that it is red-shifted. If a star is moving towards you, the waves bunch up, so the wavelength becomes shorter. The light moves towards the blue end of the spectrum, and we say it is blue-shifted. The star's actual colour doesn't change, but the colour we observe does. In both light and sound, this is called the Doppler effect. Stellar redshift and blue shift is generally too small to be detected by the human eye, but we can use the absorption lines shown by a spectrometer to measure the effect. Here you can see the spectrum from our sun on the top, and the spectrum from a distant cluster of galaxies below. Stars have mostly the same absorption lines, as they are mostly hydrogen and helium, and you can clearly see the same patterns, but for the distant galaxies, those patterns are shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. This redshift shows that the galaxies are moving away from us. Nearby stars move much more slowly, resulting in a much smaller Doppler effect, which requires very sensitive equipment to measure. We'll finish today with the maths of redshift, and calculate how fast stars are moving. First, we identify a specific absorption line in a star's spectrum, and measure its apparent Doppler-shifted wavelength. We call this lambda. Then, we look up that line's actual wavelength as measured on Earth. This is lambda naught, the wavelength measured at a speed of zero. We also need the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now we can use the redshift formula shown here to find v, the speed of the star. This formula and the speed of light are given at the front of the GCSE exam paper. You don't need to memorize them. The equation might look a little complex, but it's simple enough. You can use it and rearrange it just like any other equation. In the GCSE, you're most likely to need to calculate velocity using the rearrangement shown here. You might like to memorize this version of the equation. Have a go at this two-part question. An astronomer measures the wavelength of the H-alpha line from Proxima Centauri as 656.23 nanometers. She measures the H-alpha line in a laboratory as 656.28 nanometers. A. Is Proxima Centauri moving towards or away from Earth? And B. How fast is Proxima Centauri moving towards or away from Earth? Pause the video now and have a go. For part A, note that the Doppler shifted wavelength is lower. This means that the light from Proxima Centauri is blue shifted, so it's moving towards Earth. For part B, we simply use the rearranged formula and plug in the numbers. Take care not to mix up lambda and lambda naught. We calculate 656.23 minus 656.28. Be sure to put this part in brackets or you'll get an incorrect answer. Divide that by 656.28 and multiply by 3 times 10 to the 8. You get a result of 22,200 meters per second or 22.2 kilometers per second. The result you'll get here is actually negative. Positive velocities are away from Earth, negative velocities are towards Earth. Note that redshift and blueshift only give the velocity towards or away from us, called radial motion. You have to use other techniques to find a star's motion sideways across the sky. This is called proper motion. That's it for today. In part two, we'll classify different types of stars using something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and have an excellent day.